So yesterday evening I had the pleasure of talking to Richard Tuggle, writer and director. Mr. Tuggle wrote the 1979 film Escape from Alcatraz and also the 1984 film Tightrope, both of which star Clint Eastwood. And we also discussed some of his other work. There were a few technical issues with the recording, so please forgive those. Hello, Gareth. How are you? Well, the, the most interesting story is, is how Escape from Alcatraz came about. So I, I moved to San Francisco around 1973, and Alcatraz was basically a island out in the bay that most San Francisco residents really paid no attention to because they saw it every day. But when you're a tourist or you move there, you're kind of fascinated by this huge rock prison sitting out there facing you wherever you are in San Francisco. So I had a friend to say, do you want to go out and do the tour? And I said, sure, why not? So we go out there, and back then, it was 73, I guess, uh, back then it was a very small tour. Uh, Unfortunately, this is where my audio equipment failed, but it does continue now. And they, uh, they're always... Oh, call! We we're too busy. Call us back. And so I keep researching, and I, I find out that there's information from the Bureau, Federal Bureau of Prisons, and I go there and I get some information on the escape. And it turns out the FBI had information, so I go there, and, and it turned out that it was still an open case. They were still looking for these guys. So. I keep writing, and, and then I just want to make sure I've got it all right. I'm about to finish, and I go back to the FBI and say, I'd like to check the files again, make sure I have it right. And there was a new FBI agent, and he said, you're not allowed to look at these files. It's an open case. In fact, you weren't even allowed to look at the files in the first place. But I said, well, it's too late now. Mm -hmm. So... I keep writing, and finally I, I finished the screenplay, and I called a publishing company, and I said, I have to come to some agreement with you, because I'm, I'm going to try to go to L.A. and try and sell this thing. And this woman said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to just reverse the rights back to the author, and you just deal with him. And I was naturally kind of suspicious. I, I said, well, why, why would you do that? And she said, well, to tell you the truth, the book's out of print. We're not paying any attention to it. And the chances of you writing a screenplay about this thing is so small, it's not worth our time to do the legal issues. So with that kind of encouragement, I thought, well, okay, it's time to go to Hollywood. Hmm. So, so I go to Hollywood, and I'm living in the living room of a friend of mine's house. And uh, I didn't really know anybody or anything, but, but I, through a friend of a friend of a friend, I knew some casting agent at Paramount. And she gave the script to the story department, and they read it, and, and she called me back. She said, well, they, 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 I gave it to them, and they read it. I said, what did they think? And she said, they hated it. <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, they said it was a 1930s melodrama with no women and uh, not of interest to general population. So I thought, well, uh, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. Mm. And so I, 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 I went around to agents trying to beg people to read this thing. And I, I thought to myself, this is the most famous prison break from the most famous prison in the world. And no one is interested. I said, this is, is ridiculous. So I go to one agent, and I, I, I don't have much money, and um, and so you know, we're talking on the phone, and he says, well, mail me the script and include a self-addressed stamp envelope, and I'll mail it back to you. Uh, I don't like it. So I said, okay. So I, I, he gave me the address, and the address was like two blocks from where I was staying. So I actually drove over to the office and said to the secretary, here's the screenplay the agent's interested in. I, I live around the corner. I just wanted to drop it off, and I'll pick it up if he doesn't like it. And just then the agent comes in from the back door, and he says, who, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm that guy with Escape from Octa screenplay. And I'm holding it in my hand, and he said, well, hand it to me. So I handed him the script, thinking, you know, this, he's going to read it. And then he handed it back to me. 
And he said, now go home and mail this back to me with a self-addressed stamp envelope. So I realized that, that in Hollywood, if you're small potatoes, you're just going to be treated terribly. Mm. You know? So I went home, mailed him the script, and it turned out I ended up finding another agent, and this agent actually called and said he liked him one represent, and I had the joy of saying, forget it. So I did remember that the author, John Campbell Bruce, had said that 10 years before when the, when the book had come out, Don Siegel, who later on directed Dirty Harry and some really excellent movies, had had an, an interest in the book, and they had actually done a treatment, but they couldn't really figure out how to make it commercial enough, and he had abandoned it. And so I thought, well, I'll try and get hold of him. And I was able to reach his agent, and, and he was interested in, in reading it, and I, I sent it to him, and he really liked it. To my surprise and you know he'd done these movies with with eastwood and so he sent it to clint and clint had grown up in outskirts of san francisco and knew Alcatraz pretty well and he liked it hmm. and so they said well let's do this thing and so don siegel was going to make it a paramount even though they had turned it down and hated it and clint's deal was at warner so they there was a little fight over that but finally Clint and Don got together and Paramount, you know, agreed to make it. And, and so, you know, you've already said you hated the script. And, and Michael Eisner, the head of Paramount, said, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> so I, I'd arrived in something like March, I think it was 78 maybe, and um, they were shooting the movie on Alcatraz, uh, I think in September. And um, they spent, a, I think, about a million dollars, which was a lot of money back then, yeah. to make the prison exactly like it was in 1962. You know, all the cells had to automatically open, and the dining room, and the showers, and factory workroom, and, and everything, you know, was put back to the way it had been. And so the, the, the movie came out and, you know, got excellent reviews and did good box office. Box office. So it was a, an amazing experience. That's great. Yeah, it's an excellent film. It's one I grew up watching. I was more of a Clint Eastwood fan when he wasn't a cowboy, more of the thrillers. Well, I, I tried to see all, all the prison movies that I could. There was A Man Escape, <clears throat> the Brisson movie, which I saw and was, was very disappointed. I didn't think it was really that good. Okay. And there was Papillon, which was mm. uh, problematic also. And so and then I saw A Great Escape, you know. And so I, I think, to me, Alcatraz is probably the, the second best prison escape movie ever made because <laughs> I think Great Escape is the best. And I think Alcatraz is second best because there's not really another one that... that is in that group as far as I'm concerned and yeah, I'm trying to think. you know the, the, the movie holds up simply because the times change from you know disco to hmm. rock and roll to rap music and so on but what goes on in the movie in that prison is stays the same forever and so the movie's never dated it, it, it just it stays current yeah. no matter what year it is were you on set at any point, or did you just hand over the script and that was your, you were done with it? I went up to Alcatraz, and uh, I remember that the whole Paramount group wanted to win Clint to Paramount. So Barry Diller and Michael Eisner and Jeff Katzenberg and Don Simpson, all four of them flew up in some private plane to Alcatraz. I was on set and, and sort of said hello to them, but I, 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 I didn't. I'd done all my work there was no need to hang around so then I one, one time I went over to Paramount because when they were shooting in the cells like digging out the back walls and everything um, they had to do it on a sound stage because to get the cameras and the lighting and microphones in a small cell there wasn't room so you had to build a, a, a set that had breakaway walls so that the camera could be sort of outside the cell and, and shooting him sort of digging and so on but they, they did such an amazing job you really can't tell 
when they're on their Paramount sound stage and when they're at the prison. So I, yeah. I hung around for a little of that, but you know, it's very slow. And so the, I, was, I had another screenplay idea, and so I went on to that. So, um, you know, but I became friendly with, with Don Siegel and Clinton. Mm. And, you know, we all got along very well. Oh. Everyone was very happy. Do you remember the first time you met Clint? Because he can be quite imposing, I'm guessing. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I, I was, you know, I, mean, I was very young, you mm. know, and I, I'd never done anything, you know, and so when I met him the first time, <laughs> I remember saying something like, oh, it'll be great to go up to San Francisco, we could watch O.J. Simpson play football, <laughs> and he thought that was kind of a weird <laughs> comment, but he was a football fan, so I, I just tried to keep my mouth shut <laughs> as much as possible. Right, but the screenplay. So Don and I worked on the screenplay a little bit, but it really wasn't changed much because you know what are you going to do? You're not going to change the location. You're mm -hmm. not going to change bring in some girls. You're not going to you know whatever. It's just the escape, you know. So the only thing Don changed was I think in the original script. The Eastwood character shows up on Alcatraz, and he's, he's there for a couple of weeks or something, and he's kind of checking out the prison and decides he sees some ways maybe he can get out. And Don said, why don't you just make it, when he gets there the first day, he's going to look for ways to get out, you know, try to bump up the excitement in the beginning. Mm. And I thought that was a good idea, so I, I was happy to do that. And the only things <laughs> that he, he took out, there was one scene that was, was quite heart-rendering, really, which was at uh, Christmas, they would give the inmates, or they, first of all, they would play Christmas carols over the sound system. So here you're sitting in your cell oh. on Christmas listening to, you know, Silent Night and Jingle Bells and all that stuff. And so he, they gave the inmates some candy. So I had this scene where the Eastwood character is sitting in his cell feeling pretty low, and he drops the candy by mistake, and the gumball rolls under his bars into the hallway, and he tries to reach through the bars to reach the gumball, and he can't. So it's kind of a very, very heartfelt, sad scene. Oh, yeah. Don said, you know, it's, it's, it's such a thriller. I just want to keep moving it along. And mm -hmm. so he took that scene out. Okay. But everything else was basically right off the script. Okay, cool. What do you think happened to the escapees? Do you think they made it and went off to live on a life? or? Well, you know, I, I, I think the main reason that didn't make it was that you know, those guys would have been caught doing other robbery, you know, somehow. They wouldn't have led a, a, a perfect life. I mean, you could say, well, maybe now they're in Congress or in the British Parliament or something because the Parliament and Congress is so bad. Maybe that's where they ended up. Mm -hmm. But no, um, you, you know, I, I, I think they, they did drown. But, you know, their bodies were never found. Um, uh, you know, and about 10 years ago, somebody wrote the San Francisco Chronicle saying, it's it's me, Clarence Anglin, I'm still alive, and, and screw you. You know, so, you know, these kind of mysteries like that are always fascinating, because it's like, no one knows, and it'll just be like that forever. Yeah. I think the one scene that sits with me all the time is the, the fingers being cut off scene. That's uh, such a sad bit. Well, well, it was interesting. I remember um, in reading the book, that happened to some inmate in the 20s or 30s, I can't remember. Hmm. And I thought, boy, that's such a gruesome <laughs> thing. I, I really liked it and I wanted to use it, but I had no idea how to get that in the movie. And then it, I came up with that idea that the... Uh, the inmate was a painter, and he was painting a thing of the warden, and the warden didn't like it, and so he was going to mm. take away the painting privileges. So the the painter uh, chopped his fingers off, you know. So that was a good scene. But you know, the, you write these things, and you just never know 
you know, there's so many small things. Just for instance, the biggest problem for me was how do I end the movie? Hmm. I couldn't show them that they escaped. I didn't want to show them that they had drowned because no one knew. And I didn't want some sort of kind of vague ending. You know, I, I wanted something that, that was more personal and more interesting. And it, I, I just didn't have anything. So I was walking, I was living in Telegraph Hill on San Francisco, which was overlooking the bay and Alcatraz. And at night, the after a searchlight would shine through my bedroom window. So I was taking a walk one day and I ran into some friends and I uh, was telling this woman my problem. I just didn't have an ending that I liked and trying to figure something out about Alcatraz. And she said, well, you know, they, they grow flowers on Alcatraz. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I said, but how do I use that? Hmm. And I, I, I ended up using that flower motif giving it to the guy who chopped his fingers off who put the flower in Clint's pocket and so at the end of the movie we see the flower on the shore and either Eastwood had lost it when he was paddling or Eastwood left it there saying to the warden fuck you <laughs> I made it yeah. You know, and I thought that was perfect because it, it was personal, but it still left an uh, open ending. Yeah, that was a good one. Let's talk about Tightrope from 1984, if that's all right. Well, Tightrope is, is sort of a fascinating thing. Uh, people are very mixed about that movie because it's such a film noir, dark, sexual thing and so yeah some people really like it and thought that, that was his best movie up to that point and other people just thought it was you know standard crap but i remember i was i was actually living in san francisco when i wrote it and there was a serial killer in berkeley or oakland or something who was raping women and blindfolding and everything and the police were were trying to find him using some forensic stuff which back then was brand new in fact it, I, I don't think the the term serial killer was even used it, my vague memory was that when I used the term serial killer in the tie rope, it was the first time I'd ever heard it used because it was called mass murderers or something before that. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'd taken a lot of clippings from the papers. I just thought it was interesting, but I didn't really think I'd do anything with it. So anyway, so I moved to San Francisco, sold at Alcatraz, so I'm thinking about stuff to write. And I thought, well, you know, I've got a cop and he's chasing this uh, uh, bad guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen it a million times. And I probably can make it work. And But then I thought, well, you know, what would be interesting is if, if it, it wasn't just a regular cop, but it was a vice cop, so that there were some similarities between the vice squad cop who's dealing with sex every day and the killer who's dealing with sex in his mind every day. But I didn't know much about it, so I, I remember calling the L.A. police and saying, could I have lunch with two Vice Squad cops? I'll, I'll pay for lunch. And they gave me two cops that were sitting around having lunch. And, and I said um, to the man, I said, um what's it like how is how has it affected you being a vice squad cop and he said it's made me treat my wife more tenderly in bed and i thought wow i thought that's the movie you know the, the this cop is struggling with his own you know he breaks up with jean ville bujol and, and you know he's tempted and turned on by kinkiness but he's trying to be a normal person and so that line stays in the movie and and Eastwood just took out the last two words so he says it's made me treat my wife more tenderly um, mm -hmm. 
But anyway, you know, so, you know, the movie, you know, did good box office and got pretty darn good reviews. And, you know, I haven't seen it in a long time. I'm not sure, you know, it's as, it's as interesting now because there's so many serial killer kind of things. But this time rope was the only one that I can really remember in which the cop and the killer are sort of psychologically tied into each other. Mm. So, you know, I, I hope it holds up. It is. I, uh, I watched it a few weeks ago again because it's one I enjoy because it's uh, sort of like Dirty Harry but a lot darker. But it's a 80s well, cop film which I enjoy. It's interesting because when I wrote it, I guess I was in L.A. I'd moved to L.A. but I wrote it for San Francisco because that where it, where it happened. That where mm. it happened. And Eastwood had just made the third or fourth or whatever it was, <laughs> Dirty Harry in San Francisco, the sequel to the original. And he said, um, uh, you, you know, I don't really want to do this in San Francisco because it's sort of like Dirty Harry really being dirty and not the same old city. So I, I'd been down to Mardi Gras and knew New Orleans very well. And New Orleans is a very sort of kinky, uh, um, crazy city. <laughs> so I just rewrote it for New Orleans, and that's where we shot it. I did uh, Clint do any of the directing? Because there's some um, discrepancies on the internet about the director. Oh, you, you know, it's hard to answer that question. Mm. I would say, yes, he did. You know, the, the, the thing was is that I was in a situation of where... I was a first time director. I, I wouldn't sell him the script unless I could direct it. Right. But once uh, once I was hired, he um, uh, had his own crew. You know, he was used to directing movies. He'd fired Phil Kaufman off of a movie. So I, I was very nervous about trying to survive the thing. Sure. So when we when we got down to New Orleans, I mean, he was in charge, and it was very difficult for me trying to. I mean, I only stepped on a film set for <laughs> I don't know three days, you know. So here I was with probably the biggest movie star in the world, <laughs> yeah. and so it, it, it was a struggle. Uh, but basically, the the script was being shot like I wanted it to and, and, and as written uh, there weren't changes so there, you know it wasn't a lot for me to be angry about so I would basically have to go along with when he would talk to the crew they were listening to him not to me right and his daughter was in it also oh, yes. so it was a, not an easy situation <laughs> no I bet he was very protected it, 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 was, it was based on some guy I don't know if they ever caught him. I'm, so this was back to, this is like 1978 or something. Okay. And he, he was called Stinky because I remember that he would blindfold the women and all they really knew about him was his smell. And so, you know, that's what sort of got me interested in the whole forensic thing sure. which really now I mean it's all over TV but back yeah. then it was nothing you know, the science hadn't progressed to, to any of that so the, the, the smell was the one clue the police had you know and they, for instance they, I think the women felt that it, it smelled of grease or something Ah. So the police are just looking around factories and so on. I mean, the, the, that whole thing is, is quite fascinating in itself. There was also rumours that uh, Clint was um, out with the ladies a lot during the making of. Um, well, Clint is, you know, he's a movie star. Those <laughs> guys, movie stars and rock stars, have women chasing after them. And they, they go to bed with a lot of women. They're all, <laughs> you know, it's... it's you know, it's it's just like a uh, like a female model has lots of guys chasing her. There's lots of women chasing rock stars and movie stars. Yeah. And, you know, Clint had a lot of affairs in his life. Want to talk about Out of Bounds next? Well, Out of Bounds was basically kind of a disaster. Um, uh, Anthony Michael Hall had been a, a very hot actor, mm. and 
but was a little crazy in his own way. And we started shooting, and there was a lot of trouble. Uh, he was doing drugs, and he got in a car crash. We had to shut down the movie. And then I remember one night, there was a scene where he was walking along the street or something, and I said, look, I said, just, you know, you're scared, you're lonely, you know, I, I just want to see a, a troubled feeling in you. And he said, I don't think of those things in acting. I said, what do you think of? He said, I think of colors. <laughs> so I felt like saying, well, you know, can you can you act this in purple? But <laughs> That was that was that was the kind of experience that it, it was very painful. It almost made me not want to direct again, right? Because I, you know, I, 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 I it just didn't. It's just a, a hassle, you know. So I, the, the movie's not very good, and I'm, you know, what can I say? Uh, well, I watched it earlier. It holds up quite well. There's quite a lot of good action in it, and it does go at a great pace. Uh, you know, I've been I, I've been unable to watch it since it came out. You know, because <laughs> I just say it's it's a reminder. You know, so I don't think it's got a DVD know. or Blu-ray release yet. Um, I, I don't even know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I I I don't care. <laughs> no problem. A couple more questions before we go. Uh, it's also said that you worked on the Commando script for the 1985 Schwarzenegger film. Oh, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember. There were some good stories about that. Mm. Oh, let's see. So so I, I, I was, I think, the last writer. I'm not credited. Yeah. And I remember going into the director and having a meeting with him and saying, you know, the script's got a lot of problems. You need to change this. You need to change that, blah, blah, blah. So he picks up the phone, and he said, I- I'd like to make an appointment for 3 o'clock. And he hangs up, and I said, who, who-, who was that? He said, my my psych- psychologist. <laughs> I- he depressed me so much, I need to see him. <laughs> oh, dear. So-, so I thought, well, this is going to be quite a movie. <laughs> so then I go to one of the sound stages, and... Uh, Arnold, who had really, uh, I think, had only done what was the, the Conan the movie films with a what was it called? The Conan films. Yeah, he'd done the Conan movie, so he hadn't become an actor. Really, he was running through all the lines and going something like, "I'm going to get the bad guy," hmm. and and I, I went up to him and I said, "Arnold, in a." action movie the lead actor should never raise his voice mm-hmm. and to arnold's credit he just got that immediately and he immediately read it again you know i'm going to get the bad guy <laughs> so you know that's why he became a movie star because he, he learned very quickly and the other memory i had on that movie was that uh, I think I finally came to the end. I'd written the last scene. You know, I gave it to Larry Gordon, who was under Diller and running Fox. And he, he, I gave him the pages, and he said, he said, I really like this scene. And I said, thanks. And he said, well, we have no intention of shooting it. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, why, why not? And he said, because it's about a seaplane who lands on the water and Arnold crawls, crawls out on the wing and jumps in the bad guy's boat and kills him and so on. He said, do you know how much this is going to cost? <laughs> he said, if this were a big movie star, I would consider it, but, but you know, Arnold does not have a fan base and we're not going to spend this kind of money. Come up with something cheaper. So I leave the office and I leave the Fox building which is this Oh, I don't know, three-story building there in Century City. And as I'm going onto the parking lot to get in my car, I notice there's a door, and there's some smoke coming out of the door. And so I walk over there and open the door, and it's a, a, a sort of a utility corridor, and there's all kinds of uh, furnaces and sort of interesting stuff and s- s- smoke and stuff like that. So I ran upstairs and I said to Larry, we're going to shoot the, the end of the movie at the basement of Fox. And he said, 
I love it. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they used the basement, basement or made us, probably they built a sound stage just to be able to shoot, but that's sort of what happened. So, you know, the movie was a, was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And and Arnold became a star from it. Arnold directed your Tales of the Crypt episode, The Switch, in 1990? He wanted to direct just to see what it was like or something. Mm. And they, they had those little those little comic books or something. And, you know, I knew him and we got along pretty well. And he liked my writing. And so he just asked me if I would write it for him. And so I did. Yeah, I mean, those, those comics were actually somewhat interesting. Mm. I haven't seen that show. I don't know if I ever finally saw it, but... And then the, the, the woman in it ended up marrying uh, John Travolta. I oh, can't yes. remember her name. Yeah, because she worked with Arnold um, and Twins. Kelly Preston. You know, the, uh, Joel Silver produced it, and, and you know, it uh, did pretty well, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was a very successful show. I think it ran for three or four seasons at least. I quit writing for a while because hmm. I just got lost some interest, but I started writing again. And, you know, I've got some things I, I do care about. And, you know, one is uh, I wrote a mini series about a guy named Jimmy Doolittle, who was very famous after World War II or the beginning of World War II when he bombed Japan and, and had to land in China with the Japanese after him. But it's hard, it's very expensive, it's hard to get made. And, you know, it's hard to get anything made in, in Hollywood these days. And, you know, so, yeah. you know, I just write what I care about and, you know, don't really know what's going to happen, don't care, I don't need the money. You know, I just want to see good movies and, you know, most of the movies today are very disappointing, you know, so... Yes, that's but I would rec uh, uh, you know I, I'm a member of the Academy and I vote and so I've been looking at movies all every night trying to, to see what to vote for and I saw some pretty amazing movies and I recommend everyone see The Zone of Interest which is from a Martin Amos book that's about the Commandant of Auschwitz it's very very powerful so all I right. hope people see that okay well check that out thank you for your time well I'll tell you Gareth if you have any more questions just call me back all right. Well, yeah, I've got your number now, so no problem. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time, sir. Well, thanks. Okay. See you later. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.